The nation's infrastructure report card is out, and it highlights the need for major improvements. Now, this report looks at 18 different segments of infra infrastructure, including the nation's aviation system, which earned, listen to this, a D+. Plus. This follows January's deadly mid-air collision in Washington. Chris Van Cleve has the details. Chris, good morning. D-plus doesn't sound good for aviation for people who have to fly on a regular basis. That sounds scary. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning, Gail. Some of these sectors got grades that would probably get you grounded. The best performers, we're talking about our ports and railways, but when it comes to roads, dams, and the aviation system, they were among the worst performers. And this comes as aviation safety will be the focus of a key hearing on Capitol Hill this week, and the families of those killed in that midair collision are demanding change. It's so much loss. It's so much unnecessary loss. Rachel Ferris feels like she has to be a voice for those silenced in January's midair collision over Washington, D.C. I want people to remember that all 67 souls on board were precious. They were beautiful. This isn't just an accident that we move on from. Among them, her cousin Peter Livingston, his wife, and their two young daughters. I miss him terribly. And the, the moments that they'll really undo me is when I look at the pictures of his girls. Those are the moments that I find just impossible. You won't get to see them grow up. They won't graduate from high school. They won't go to the Olympics. They won't get married. They won't have babies of their own. And they deserved that. They deserved that. She wants lawmakers and the FAA to take action now to make flying safer. The newly released infrastructure report card gave the U.S. aviation system a D plus, unchanged from four years ago, due in part to the slow pace of modernization and a funding gap of $114 billion over the next 10 years. While we have made progress, there certainly are warning signs and that tell us that we need to further invest. Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy is now calling for rapid updates to the country's aging air traffic control system. Does it upset you that it takes people dying to get attention to make a change? Somebody called it a tombstone mentality. Every regulation is written in blood, and that's not the way we should be doing things. I think that's outrageous. Is that what makes you want to fight for change? This loss is with us forever. And... I don't want anyone else to experience this. Overall, infrastructure earned a C. Eight of the 18 segments showed improvement, and the authors credit the billions of dollars that have been spent under the infrastructure bill for that improvement. The underperforming sectors have large unfunded gaps between where the funding is now and future needs, as well as uh, need to focus more on resiliency against severe weather. Tony. Chris, some powerful uh, interviews there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It takes a long time to become an air traffic controller, and many are quitting before they are fully trained up. That is why the U.S. is short about 3,000 air traffic controllers, and many airports have seen travel delays this summer as a result. Chris Van Cleve visited the one place where the FAA trains controllers to find out how the job gets done. November 825 X-Ray Romeo. The students in this room hope to be the next generation of air traffic controllers in training at what amounts to ATC boot camp in Oklahoma City. It's not easy. About 35 percent will fail. If somebody washes out, are they eligible to try again? No. So it's uh, one and done. It's one and done. Chris Wilbanks oversees training and the FAA's effort to address the air traffic controller shortage. This is where it all starts, right here. Envoy 432 to the Greenville Airport. The FAA is working to reduce the washout rate, adding a mentoring program to help students during the roughly three months they are at the FAA training center. The agency has also streamlined the application process and expects more than 2,000 students this year, the most ever. But a CBS News data review found over 90 percent of air traffic control towers in the U.S. were understaffed. We don't have enough air traffic controllers working the airspace, which means it gets slower, you get delayed, and then you get frustrated. United 772 Heavy requests taxi to the terminal. Part of the training amounts to a giant tabletop exercise with handheld plane models flying around the room. You see people holding model airplanes. And yes. 
that looks like something out of the 50s. Correct. Is that an effective way to train? I'm glad you asked. That train. is an absolute crucial part to the training. It slows things down for them. It gives them an opportunity to learn the airspace. $1,285. But the future of ATC training may look like this. Immersive tower simulators have been installed in 95 facilities nationally, cutting controller certification time by 27%. This is critical. This is absolutely critical. We can create real-time training and have controllers trained on those types of situations within a matter of a week after the event happens. The FAA does not allow interviews with students, but did let us try out the simulator. Alaska 517 Academy Tower, runway 28 right, line up and wait. Now you can tell him, let post traffic approved. With the help of course coordinator Eric Weedell. She's just handed me a strip. What does that mean? It's the aircraft on that taxiway. They'll be calling you when they reach the runway edge, looking for a takeoff clearance. You're going to have to wait. It's a lot to manage. Planes circling, taxiing, waiting to take off, and others on approach to land. Air France 113 Heavy, Academy Tower, go around. Air France 113 Heavy, go around. And every word matters. Runway 28 right at Taxiway Echo. Contact ground went off. Turning right at Taxiway Echo. Unable. Twin Cessna Zero Mike November. One word was missing from your transmission, Commander and that one word made all the difference. The FAA is also expanding a program that lets ATC students at eight colleges across the country do that same basic training at their university. Even once that's complete, though, it can take two years or more of on-the-job training to fully certify a controller. Tony? Really interesting, Chris. Did it deepen your respect for this organization, this group of people you've covered for so long? Yeah, it's harder than it looks. You know, every word matters, and the order of the words matter. You can say the right thing, but say it the wrong way, and that's still a problem. Yeah, the stakes are really high. Yeah, it got to me, Chris, when he said uh, one word, you left out one word, and that one word could be the key to maybe life and death in some situations. Right. Yeah, really. Very, a lot of pressure there. I'd be out there like, you there, the blue plane. Yes. <laughs> With the stripes. <laughs> Chris, thank you. What will pilots do if there's a major disruption with air traffic control? Chris Van Cleve decided to find out. Blacked out air traffic control screens, communications issues in Newark, Denver, and Jacksonville, all since April. Signs of an aging air traffic control system. Currently we are stopped on departures. Approach control lost their radar again. Well, I don't want those to happen. Transportation Secretary Sean Duffy. The pilots, when that happens, they know that they have to look to, a, to another center or, or TRACON or tower to communicate with, and they all start to pay close attention and stay away from each other. Ahead of the next big summer travel push, we wanted to see that in action. We operate on a system of multiple layers of redundant systems. Captain Miles Morgan oversees United Airlines Flight Training Center in Denver. Was losing air traffic control on the list of things you practice? This is not the first time this has happened. One of the first things you learn as a pilot when you're getting your instrument rating in a small airplane is what to do if you lose communication with the air traffic control facility. All right, ready to go? Yeah. Clear for takeoff. Inside a 737 MAX simulator, we are at the controls for a first-hand look, taking off from a simulated Newark Liberty Airport. 100 knots. Once airborne, we're dialed into air traffic control on an assigned radio frequency. Air traffic control goes out right now. You're over New York City. What happens? So the first thing is I'm on this primary frequency. I would immediately go to the frequency that I was last on, which is now in my standby. Another radio is set to an emergency channel that all ATC centers and other aircraft can hear. If that doesn't work... The third layer of redundancy we have is this text messaging system. While flying, the 737's transponder sends a signal identifying the plane to controllers and other aircraft. Pilots can change that number to 7600, the code for comms trouble. Hey, this aircraft has lost communication, so they'll start separating aircrafts, you know, around from us. All airliners also have an onboard collision avoidance system known as TCAS that's scanning the skies for other planes. Traffic, traffic. So now I'm going to stop everything that I'm doing. I'm going to look at my navigation display, and I see that I've got traffic encroaching on me 600 feet above. What happens if you're not a safe distance away? So my aircraft would give me a command. If my aircraft was told to descend, that aircraft would be told to climb, and that would increase the separation. If there's one of these ATC outages and I'm in the air, I'm a passenger, am I less safe because of that? Absolutely not less safe. You, you might be inconvenienced because we're going to immediately have delays. 
those delays happen because air traffic controllers will immediately limit the number of aircraft operating in the chunk of airspace that's having issues. Air traffic controllers also have backups, backup radio channels, and if one center does go dark, other FAA facilities can track the airplanes in the air, so no one's lost in space, if you will, and all this is going on amid the push for billions of dollars to modernize the air traffic control system, Michelle. Oh, Chris, we did it a different way back in the olden days. I'm sure they're picking up on those lessons now. Thank you so much. We're getting a first look at research that could make the skies safer. A team at the University of Maryland is working on a flight suit that may help pilots avoid disorientation by using vibrations. Chris Van Cleve tried it out during a simulated flight. Anuta Data is learning to fly helicopters. Helicopter 304 Romeo Cubic. A University of Maryland professor focused on helicopter design and dynamics. He knows better than most about the danger of pilot disorientation. It happens when you fly into clouds or bad weather. The FAA says pilot disorientation causes 5 to 10 percent of all general aviation accidents, and they are nearly always fatal. Investigators believe it was a factor in the 1999 small plane crash that killed John F. Kennedy Jr. and in the 2020 helicopter crash that killed Kobe Bryant. Spatial disorientation is a big deal in aviation and it's basically where the pilot cannot determine which way is up or down or whether the airplane is banking to the left or to the right. Dada is now helping test new technology being developed at the University of Maryland that could one day be part of a flight suit or built into a pilot's seat. Do you feel like when it comes to disorientation that this kind of technology could be a lifesaver? Oh yes, absolutely. Think of it as something similar to lane departure technology in some cars. Pitch back more. Using haptic drop. vibration to tell a pilot how to respond if they're showing signs of disorientation. The pilots typically fly through two uh, primary sensory cues, which are vision and equilibrium. Professor Umberto Saietti is leading the research effort. Basically, the suit provides a, another sensory cue to try and deconflict the conflicts that may arise from reading the aircraft instruments and whatever the pilot is feeling. So the idea is to give one more line of defense before an accident. That is correct. There we go. Donning a virtual reality headset and wearing special vibrating sensors on my arms. I got you loud and clear. We tried the technology in this F-35 simulator. This is a major cinder storm. As the visibility decreases around me. I got a stall warning. Yeah. <laughs> I did not think I was pitched up that much. I'm relying solely on instruments and those sensors to keep the plane level, and it is not easy. I have no idea if I'm going down or up at this point. The vibrations guide me which way to turn. There we go. Uh, Got to go a little right. Now a little left. Flying level. The research team aims to eventually conduct actual flight tests using sensations they hope help pilots feel their way towards safer skies. Once the technology is refined, it would still need to be certified by the FAA before it could go into an airplane. And the technology also needs to get small enough to fit into a flight suit or be embedded in a pilot's chair. Vlad? Really interesting. Very cool. Chris Van Cleef for us. Thank you, Chris.